Hi, I'm Sol Walkling from the Australian Stand First Foundation and I'm here with Stephanie Clerc. And hi Stephanie. Hello, how are you Sol? Good, how are you feeling today? Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, now we talked a little bit already about mm -hmm. um, the interview and uh, I gather you've got quite an interesting childhood that brought you to the One Health organisation that we're discussing today. Do you mind just filling me in on um, what your drivers were and what brought mm -hmm. you into the area? Sure, so um, my family are very crazy travellers. We actually lived uh, on a boat in Africa when I was a small child. Wow. And when I was a teenager, my father, who's Swiss, started working for the International Red Cross. So with that, I spent time in uh, Croatia, just around the whole, uh, Croatia and Serbia during the Kosovo, mm -hmm. just after Kosovo happened, and Sudan. How, how old were you at the time? I was um, 7, 16, 17, mm -hmm. sometime in Ivory Coast in Sudan. And so I got to see really firsthand um, what's really happening in the world in some of the more disaster stricken areas. And I spent time in uh, refugee camps in Sudan during the separation war in the south. and. Um, it was a really, really different view of the world than most mm -hmm. of my peers when I came back to school in Australia. The understanding that they had of, of how lucky we were and what was important was really mm -hmm. different. So very young, I decided I wanted to do something to contribute to... So it really impacted you, obviously. really did, yeah. yeah. Um, and you knew you wanted to do something, but mm -hmm. which capacity did your dad have? In he was actually a telecommunications engineer in the mm -hmm. organisation, okay. so he wasn't working in direct support right. um, of, you know, social change initiatives or crisis initiatives, but he was coordinating a lot of the communications that all the Red Cross were using to navigate war zones and those kinds of things. And just, it's completely tangent right yeah. now, but what were the most touching experiences perhaps that you had at the time as a, that you can still remember, maybe, mm. you know, you, I remember when we were in Ivory Coast and I would have been 13 or 14 and my dad had to go into Liberia so there was um, that was so that was about uh, 98 uh -huh. 98 and so that there was a huge civil war in Liberia that was extremely mm. brutal and my mum and I went with him to the border of Liberia and Ivory Coast which is a town called Tabu a little fishing village and so we stayed there while dad went to do some work and came back and on that in that border town there's a big river there where lots of refugees were swimming across this huge river trying to get out of Liberia hmm. and um, a lot of them were missing a limb because the People's Liberation Army of Liberia had their way of well, actually I don't know why they were doing it but I guess it was making a point they go through villages and they just remove one limb from everybody in the village. Or ensuring that they couldn't fight perhaps or I'm actually not sure what mm. would cause that kind of brutality. Mm. You know, I have yeah, some theories. <laughs> um, and so a lot of these people who were fleeing were missing a limb. Mm. And I remember being in this little restaurant and um, just on the beach, we're eating a fish and there were two boys my age. One of them was missing a leg and one of them had all his limbs. And I was eating my fish and they were just looking at me with these eyes of intense, intense hunger, you know. Mm -hmm. I was really uncomfortable and I was like, can I give them my dinner? And dad's like, just eat your dinner. When you're done, we'll buy them their own dinner. You know, mm -hmm. just eat your dinner. So I ate my fish. I was hungry. And I'd completely finished this fish. I was, it was, I'd eaten all of it, my perspective. And then, I, you know, they went to take it away. And the boys were like, oh, can we have it? And they took this completely finished meal. And they just chewed every single bone and oh. spat it out again. And, and just seeing these other kids my age, that that was the situation they were in. Mm. I, think that, that, I think that's a moment that really... The stark contrast. Yeah, and you know, and they were just like me, but they mm. were not. You know, their experience was so different. I couldn't even imagine what mm. um, they had gone through. So, what did that leave with you? What did it create in you? Was that like a, that was a changing moment? Obviously, yeah, like an epiphany. It really gave me this insight into the injustice in the world and the inequality mm. that that we have, and it made me feel determined to be part of changing that. And that mm. born. Um, into the part of the world that I was born into. Mm. Well, actually, the two countries I was born into, my mm -hmm. mother's Australian, my father's Swiss. Like, it's extremely lucky. Mm. And that's a huge amount of privilege and education and opportunities that I have. I was determined to do something with that to try and address some of those inequalities. Mm. And how did you then become involved in the social, social change movement? And what was the first step for you? Um, I went to university and studied law and anthropology. Mm -hmm and international politics. 
and then I got quite frustrated with the the way that we were approaching change in the world. Um, I was disillusioned and decided that that I needed just to get out of that world for a while. So I just did a lot of traveling and I went and lived out in the forest for maybe seven years. Mm. Uh, and I became a herbalist. I decided I wanted to help people more directly with the skills that mm. I could have on a one-on-one -on -one basis because I no longer, I, the more I learn about the UN and the World Health Organization and the way that large global organizations are trying to navigate problems, to me it felt like they were just patching up the people who were falling through the cracks and never mm. actually making it an attempt to, to, change the, to change the system mm -hmm. that we have globally which is creating injustice. It's always just around trying to, it's a big statement. It's how I felt when I was 19, 20, mm. was, which made me walk away from that as a career. Um, so was this sense of just like, oh, we're just patching up the people who fall through the cracks and it's endless and we're not changing what's really underneath mm -hmm. this system. And I'm just walking away from it. I'm hearing there might now be, um, you actually being part of changing the system. Yeah, so <laughs> is that what One Health is. Hopefully. Um, One Health has had a really, also a very long journey. Mm. Uh, I started volunteering for One Health seven years ago, mm -hmm. which at that point One Health had been operating for seven years already. And again, it started with, um, as a, a holistic health organisation for disadvantaged community groups in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So we had a naturopath and a juice bar for um, the at-risk at youth drop-in centre. Mm -hmm. We are doing acupuncture and counselling for uh, survivors of torture and trauma who had refugees mm -hmm. with their um, it's the Sydney Starts the organisation. Mm -hmm. It's a refugee organisation in Sydney, and we had other other projects like that. And when I came on around seven years, we were going through a real shift, seeing that this is all really great, and we're giving great support to these people. But medical care, whatever kind of medical care it is, is such a small part of creating health for people mm -hmm. who are really in disadvantaged and vulnerable situations. Um, and we've now made a shift after working with many other organisations who were in a similar environment. We're now looking at how do we actually facilitate a collaborative approach to looking at the underlying drivers of poor health in communities. Okay. Can I just um, take a step back? Sure. So who is we? Because I think <laughs> the team probably really plays a role mm -hmm. in what is happening at One Health. I believe it's changed a bit over the years and um, they're very different skill sets at work. So um, Jimmy Wollumbin is the founder and he's mm -hmm. still a core part of the organisation. And then, so really we're three people. Mm -hmm. Benjamin who has a background in corporate branding and marketing mm -hmm. and he's also an Ayurvedic practitioner. Jimmy is an unusual combination, an unusual combination <laughs> and a yoga teacher. Well, I think yeah. the Ayurveda and yoga teaching was like a change of life moment for him. Mm -hmm. He still works in corporate branding and he works with us. Um, Jimmy is a doctor of Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. and I'm also a Western herbalist and anthropologist, and I have my own background. So, unintentionally, we all have health. Uh, we also all practice as healthcare workers, mm -hmm. yeah. independently in natural health, mm -hmm. of, in natural health mm -hmm. uh, independently of our work with One Health mm -hmm. organization. And that's really now that we're the core. And then there've been other volunteers coming and going, or um, people working for a short period of time with us. Mm -hmm. But we've now been. One Health for seven years. Okay. Yeah. And in that time, um, what projects has One Health been involved? I know there's a lot. Yeah. But what projects stood out perhaps for you that you've been involved with that have really created that change that you so desire? Mm. The last, um, maybe the last six years, up until about a year ago, our focus was on incubating grassroots health, community health organisations. Mm -hmm. yeah. We saw a real gap. Um, and we started having a lot of other organisations come to us and say, oh, you guys seem like you've got your governance really sorted out or you've got great corporate partnerships. How did you do that? Can you help us do that? And we organically started responding to these requests until we realised that the best thing we could do would be to hand over all of our own community health projects uh -huh. to other community organisations because uh -huh. we've always done things in partnership um, with other organisations. We found that was the least resource intensive way uh -huh you know, share the overheads, share the infrastructure, and then it, you get more done. Mm. And then we, we officially launched our incubator. So then we were working okay. with um, a variety of different projects all over Australia um, to help them with, 
you know, training and communication strategy and networking and philanthropic funding, um, getting clear on their strategy, collaborating with other organisations. Wow, so you can really impact um, the landscape in Australia mm. yeah, of different organisations. Yeah. How did you, so the three of you, how did you come to that point that you said, okay, it's more efficient, but here's also what we can help with, with that this is the team and this is what we can bring to the table for yeah. these organisations? What was that key moment? Was it, there? it was partly just, um, it was, as I said, it was quite organic because mm. we kept having more and more requests from other organisations mm -hmm. to do that. And that was the moment that Benjamin and I both started in that time. So mm. that shift was probably more... Uh, Jimmy's shift because mm -hmm. he had oh, been okay. working it up until that point and then it was a question of like do we hand these projects over our vision is health for all it's an extremely audacious I goal <laughs> and there's no way we can achieve that mm. unless we're working in a very collaborative way we can't mm. do that alone mm. we're only three people who have other jobs and do work part-time in one health how do you do that how do you manage it what are you how do you do it on a day-to-day -day basis on a day-to-day -day basis um, what we've been really doing, as, so then is collaborating with a lot of other organisations yes. and then in the last year we've had to put a pause on our incubator program, mm -hmm. um, mainly because it's incubating other organisations is a very unstable fund financial model mm -hmm. because the, the organisations who really, really need that support and are going to thrive in that kind of condition, they don't have the funds to pay for support. So then you're giving, doing everything pro bono. And we mm. see these, um, so many great organisations that turn around and say to us, we wouldn't be here if you guys hadn't had our back for the last five years. And that's a really rewarding feeling. Mm. But then we're interested in how do we go beyond just supporting other organisations to stay mm -hmm. alive? How do we change the whole landscape of how we understand community health and how we work together to achieve that? We ran a great event last year called Thriveability. We brought together as many of the projects that we know and philanthropists and consultants and experts in different areas mm -hmm. together. And we ran a two day, um, some panels, some workshops, but a lot of design shops where everyone was working together on different problems. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was fantastic, but people were saying, we wished it was all focused around one issue. Like I wish we could do this with everyone working in our area you know, because it was mm -hmm. very different organisation. Yeah. And we really thought about that and thought, well, can we try and do that? And so that's something we're going to try and do this year. We're working with Asthma Australia as like the large national organisation that's supporting mm -hmm. us. And we're working with a small um, social enterprise health and medical clinic in Brisbane, working mm -hmm. with refugees and disadvantaged migrants. And we're going to work with them to bring as many people and other organisations from that area, refugee health in Brisbane, mm -hmm. health and well-being, it's, it's not just around health, it's also around employment, education, all of these things, mm -hmm. bring them all together and really try to understand what, what is the issue here? Mm -hmm. What is the situation? What is the system that a disadvantaged migrant or refugee or asylum seeker who lands in this part of Brisbane, what's actually going on for them? What's their lived experience? Mm -hmm and go to the community and speak to them, what is your lived experience? What are the pain points? What do you really need that isn't actually here? And try to create a really dynamic picture of the whole system in that area. And that everybody at that table say, how can we work together to try and shift this in a fundamental way? It sounds very efficient. And it's also very <laughs> ambitious at the same time. So where, when is that event? Is that already planned? It's, we've just started working um, with that organisation in Brisbane, yeah. so we're mapping out what that process will look like mm. and then the first point of call is for they hold the relationships with the community, mm. which we don't, and so of course that's something we've really learned over the years. You can't just go into a community and be like, right, we're here to solve your problems, tell us what's wrong. Sure. Mm. That those things are built on really deep relationships. Mm. So we're so lucky to be working with World Wellness. They have been working in that community for 10 years. They have everyone in their staff is multicultural, has speaks different languages, has had direct experiences themselves of what it's like to be in a foreign country and disadvantaged. And, and, and so and they know, so that with them, we're going to start having focus groups and interviews with different refugees and asylum seekers and disadvantaged migrants in Brisbane. Start there. From understand the issues from their perspective hmm. and say what are these issues and who's involved in solving them in this area. Maybe they all say 
you know, oh, there's gr all these great services, but we can't get to them. We're like, yeah. okay, we need to have the transport so, people okay. at, the, at the conversation. So, and it was, I think what's ambitious is that we don't know what the end result will be. It's a very consultative process, essentially. Yeah, you have to listen, really. You yeah. have the tools, by the sounds of it, and the experience, but then you really go in and you listen to exactly what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And you have a process, it sound, by the sounds of it, that enables these um, organisations to then problem solve. Is yes, that right? That's is that right. kind of the, yeah, yeah if I yeah. sum it up? Um, now, something else we touched on just before uh, was um, also, um, and also in this interview, you were saying that um, you wanted to change the view that society has of health, mm -hmm. perhaps, and prob health problems in um, disadvantaged communities, in particular in addressing the different lifestyle um, lifestyle problems as well. Mm. Is that right? Or, yeah. yeah. So, do you want to talk about that a little bit as well? Absolutely. Um, I th and I think Australia is actually a bit behind the eight ball on that. If you look at the conversations that are happening in the USA or even what the World Health Organization is doing, they're really shifting the, the dial from health as a medical problem mm -hmm. to health as a social, economic, um, behavioral, a really complex problem, environmental problem. You mm. know? And um, whereas I feel that here we're still very much public health is a medical discipline mm -hmm. when I'm not sure if that's the most efficient way to achieve health and well-being. All the research with, yeah. <laughs> with the World Health Organization at the moment is saying that medical care, your access to medical care and the quality of your medical care only creates up to 30% of your health outcomes. And it's not preventative in any, any way really, yeah? So. It's not preventative, no. And so then if you had um, if you had the best medical care that every single disadvantaged person in the world could access whenever they wanted, the best surgeons, the best, every immunisation you can dream of, mm. it still would only have, it would only account for 30% of our health outcomes. Now there's another chunk which is lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And what is that? How much in percentage? It's about 30 as well. Okay. So yeah. exercise, food, smoking, alcohol, all these lifestyle factors. That you can really touch as well, yeah? You that can, you can really touch, quite yeah. And the interesting thing though, that when we talk about lifestyle drivers of chronic disease, mm. that's really relevant when we are um, socially mobile or, or, or that we have agency in our lives. Yes. So for me, if someone says to me, look, you're really at risk of diabetes, you need to eat really good food and you need to go to, and to, the, go to the gym and go and do yoga three times mm -hmm. a week. I have the ability to do that because I have so much agency over my own life. Mm -hmm. I can rearrange my schedule, I can t knock off work early on Wednesday, you know, however it goes. I have mm. that ability to create that change. Mm. But for people in vulnerable and disadvantaged situations, they don't have that agency. At all. Yeah. And telling someone, oh, you've got to quit smoking or you've got to not eat so much, you know, terrible food because you're going to get sick. When you, everything else, like when you don't have money, when you don't, you live in an area where there's no good food available, when, you know, maybe you're experiencing domestic violence, like mm. I just, I'm not going to care about my cigarette smoking mm. if I'm going home every night and, and getting beaten up. You know, it's, it's just the socio-cultural and economic environment that people live in determines their behaviours and their mm. behaviours determine their health so much more than what their medical care is. So what is or what are the answers then? Because it seems like a multifaceted approach is then required, yeah? Absolutely. And so there's great research coming out in you know in systems thinking and applying systems thinking to um, to to social development and community mm -hmm. development and how can we look at health not as this linear causality, mm -hmm. but this very complex in a way, health puts the human face on the very complex nature of social disadvantage. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's measurable, you can see in someone's blood and you can look at them, you can analyse them and say, well, yes, health is a real issue here. And so if we focus on health, we can unpack all these factors that lead to inequality mm. in disadvantaged communities. But to address that is a very as you said, it's very complex, it's very multifaceted, mm. it requires collaboration. Mm -hmm. To think that we can actually create a healthy community, one organisation, even in one small community, you just can't. You know, that you need to be working with everybody else, you need to be working with the education people, you need to be mm. working with the local soup kitchen, you need to be working with the domestic violence counsellors and the legal support and the local government and, you know, and that's, I think, our challenge. It's an overwhelming it challenge, yeah, it, it is. seems. Yeah, so. it is, because it requires us shifting from 
a very organization centric focus mm -hmm. of like this is my organization this is what we do we did this thing and it worked <laughs> and I feel that if I feel that I, I, I have the need to say that and be able to prove that what I'm doing is is useful and valuable but if we can't shift from an organization centric approach to a mission centric or a person centric mm -hmm. approach then I think we're in trouble what you talked about before with um, the event that you're leading up to and also Thrivability, which you ran mm -hmm. last year, um, it seemed uh, agency and engaging the people from um, disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, I guess, yeah. really does help create that change. Is that right? So perhaps so. that might be a way of, of bringing people in who have more um, of a mission focus mm -hmm. as opposed to needing to say, they achieved it or their organisation achieved it. Is that, do you see that in the industry or industry is probably in the, <laughs> in the area at all? I, I think it's great you picked up on agency actually mm. as a topic. Uh, I watched this fantastic lecture by Dr Len Symes who's the Professor Emeritus of Public Health at Berkeley University mm -hmm. and he's the guy who 40 years ago started first talking about social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, and this, I'll, send, I'll maybe send you the link, you can find it on YouTube. Um, he was saying that in all his 40 years of research in, in community health and his spectacular succession of failures at really making an impact, yeah. what he's come to this point of saying that this strange thing called agency may be the single most important factor in mm. creating healthy people and healthy communities. It's exactly what you're saying. So that, that's an interesting thing for us to try and wrap our minds around because it's such an intangible concept. How do you increase agency? How do you empower to enga or engage to empower? Yeah, yeah? that's kind of. I think if you want to paraphrase it to a degree, if you engage yeah. and empower, then people can take you know agency and people can feel more um, inspired themselves mm. and create change from within. Yeah, definitely. So paraphrasing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what you're saying is that um, it's the way we do things rather than what we're actually doing. Mm. That we have to pay just as much attention to how we go about delivering our programs. In our, in our organization as we do to what the program is mm. and what the outputs are, mm. you know, yeah. I feel like we've come kind of to, to a conclusion on that point almost, right? right? Yeah. There's not much, not much further we can go with that one. Um, the other topic we wanted to talk about um, was um, Asthma Australia. You're involved in mm -hmm. a project with them as well. Can you talk yeah. about that yes, just that's for a, a moment? Yeah. The project I was speaking about before mm. that it's um, at the moment we have three organisations that are collaborating mm -hmm. together. One of, that's, one of those is Asthma Australia mm -hmm. and they're actually a fantastic organisation. We know their CEO, Michelle Goldman, she used to be the CEO for School for Social Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So that in a way we were peers as accelerators. So we have quite a good working relationship with her. Yeah. And they're really at a point where they're looking at um, as a health promotion charity, one of these really big charities, Asthma Australia, you know, Heart Foundation, mm. all of these large um, health promotion charities that get really big budgets as well compared to a lot of the small NGOs that we work with. Mm. They have, uh, I won't, I won't generalise, I know that say a lot of their work has been focused on the mainstream Australia, education campaigns around lifestyle, mm. essentially. Um, Asthma Australia, it's a lot about how do you manage how do you manage your child's asthma or your asthma? How do schools manage kids with asthma to prevent hospitalisation? Mm -hmm. uh, asthma, asthma is actually one of the main drivers of childhood hospitalisations and um, expenses in the health system as well. And you know, Heart Foundation has had all the healthy living, active living campaigns. And as we said, that's really great for mainstream Australia. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you're looking at vulnerable and disadvantaged communities, it's just not enough because they, they live in an environment that is not supportive of making those changes. Mm. And so Asthma Australia has approached us and said, you know, your expertise is in uh, small community initiatives for disadvantaged community groups. Can you work with us to design a pilot to understand how we can also have an impact in these kinds of communities? And so that's what we've doing, we're doing. And our first wow. response was, we'd love to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm but we need to be working with a community organisation on the ground. And so in a way, we're sitting here as the facilitators mm. of that conversation. And where is that at at the moment? So, so far we have, um, we, we've been mapping out what that process will look like, so mm. what we're talking about. Some of that will be an event, we bring together all the people working in 
um, in Brisbane with that with the that community, mm. and we're going to be looking at three different chronic diseases parallel to each other. Mm -hmm. So asthma will be one of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe cardiovascular disease is another, mm -hmm. and uh, probably mental health, mm -hmm. uh, easily, or maybe diabetes, but it would depend on the people we're working with and mm -hmm. what are their most pressing problems. And one of the things we're really hoping to demonstrate through that is that they're all part of the same problem. Mm -hmm. Th those three, we, we treat them as distinct diseases, mm -hmm. but comorbidity is huge. Mm -hmm. So people with asthma are twice likely to have mental health, people with cardiovascular disease are twice as likely to have diabetes, etc. So the comorbidity is huge and some of the socioeconomic drivers of those illnesses are, are very common. They're all common to each of those illnesses. And at the moment we're looking, the way we do public health is disease specific. So we have, this is a program to solve lung cancer. Mm -hmm. This is an organisation right. to reduce obesity mm -hmm. rather than looking at, well, this. How are these all connected? Yeah. And is it really inefficient to try to solve asthma nationally and then solve um, hmm. diabetes nationally? Is it more efficient? This is, this is our working thesis at the moment. We're saying it's more effective and more efficient to work with individual communities, mm -hmm. not diseases, and look at all of the factors that contribute to a whole range of poor health outcomes. Mm -hmm. I saw that you also really want to impact longer term health outcomes. Yeah? So yeah. that's kind of, uh, what are you putting in place for that then? So this will be part of the co-design process with the community. Okay. If we understand what's important to them mm. and what they understand to be their own pain points. Mm. Uh, I'd love to have this conversation again. Yeah, I would <laughs> so love to. Let's have this conversation 18 months to yeah. tell you what we came up with. Because it's a really interesting point for you. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a huge potential mm -hmm. with this, pro well, with all the projects you've had, I guess, but this seems to be the potentially the um, furthest ranging that you've that you've had so far, Definitely. is that right? Yeah. yeah. And with the support of Asthma Australia as well, there's potentially then the, um, the funding as well, mm -hmm. is that right? So to, to yeah. actually create longer term strategies. Yeah. Um, what are you looking at at the moment? Is it so at the moment you're in that design, design process mm -hmm. and you're, um, can you project what you, from, from your previous experience, how long you think it's going to take to implement a few of the first steps? And then longer term, would you be looking at, you know, doing, um, implementing, yeah. I'll let you talk, because <laughs> I'm just making it up now. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? The design phase is fun. Uh, I think we need, to, we need to separate the process of engaging the community and the local stakeholders yeah. from the actual initiatives that will be implemented okay, okay. later, because right. what we can design is that process. How do we mm -hmm. bring people together? How do we facilitate collaborative action and, the, and a shared vision of what the problem really is, what mm -hmm. the underlying problem is? How do we facilitate that shared vision and then that collaborative action? Mm -hmm. But it's inappropriate for us as an external organisation to already have an idea of what we think needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this is where of the course. agency comes in. If 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 we try to step into a role of we're here to tell you how to fix your problems, that completely undermines agency. Mm -hmm. And one of these root causes of disadvantage, inequality, and poor health we're then reinforcing that root cause. There's a real shift though to how it used to be done, yeah, that you're kind of creating. Yeah. That. So we're really trying to focus on how we do do it yeah. and how we bring people to the table to have a collaborative design process mm -hmm. around in their own community, not just the vulnerable community members, but also the organisations that work there. Mm -hmm. And on a government level, have you had um, some conversations there as well to bring... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> starting to. Yeah. So um, the, this pilot is actually funded by the Federal Health Department. Mm -hmm. So that's hopefully will open up a, co a conversation around how we do public health mm -hmm. and how we do um, community health in Australia. Mm -hmm. We're planning on trying to get the Queensland government involved as mm -hmm. well. There's a potential that we'll host the event at Queensland public, uh, Parliament House, oh, which will be a great... Yeah. Um, yeah, it will, be, it will be a great mm. door opener, hopefully. Because, again, if we don't, the government is part of this system. Mm -hmm. If we don't have them at the table, we'll be remiss in what we're trying mm. to do. Whether are or not you, they come, who knows. Where are you looking for inspiration? Are you seeing that in other countries or overseas or so that these initiatives are taking hold and are working? Or are you just engineering the process as you like? Um, a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we're doing is... Um, building on really great philosophy that already exists around public health, comprehensive approaches to public health, um, the social determinants of health, the World Health Organization is talking about it, in the states hospitals are starting to get community workers in because they're understanding that because they're all for profit in mm -hmm. the states and they're understanding it's more cost effective long term if they have 
you know, housing officials in the hospital to deal with the, with the people who are falling through the gaps. So these kinds of things are happening, mm -hmm. but not quite the way we're um, about to engage on. So mm -hmm. it's also around us trying to put our money where our mouth is. We've been talking for a long time about collaborative approaches and comprehensive public health, and we have been collaborating. But we've been collaborating in a very, um, we'll help you do what you need to do. Okay, now we'll help you do what you need to do. I will have a conversation here. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is actually around trying to facilitate other people working together with mm -hmm. each other in their local area. And if you had a call to action to anyone who's viewing this or listening to this, what would that be? Is there something that, oh, that I could do? Yeah. There are a few different things. One mm. is if people are based in the Brisbane area and working in, in community health, in refugees and disadvantaged migrants to get in touch with us because mm. we'd love them to be part of that journey. Another thing is to really start thinking about what health is. What is health for you personally? Mm. How do we create health? Health is much more than just your doctor's checkup or even going to your acupuncturist or anything like that. Like yeah. health, what makes you feel well. Preventative. Is, yeah. Preventative, it's also mm. the time you spend with your friends mm. and the great book that, you know, that course you did last year that really opened your mind and mm. all these things contribute to our health. And we also have a fantastic um, fundraising platform called Impact 100. We're looking mm. for 100 different people or businesses who want to come on board and contribute $1,000 to this process. Okay. And there's lots of opportunities to then be really engaged. We want to engage those people as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Have like video conferences with them, get their ideas, hear their input and depending on if it's appropriate, there'll be some spots available to attend the event. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Wow. You can find that on our website. Great. Um, just the website again? Onehealthorganisation.org. Thank you. And that's organisation with an S, okay. the Australian uh -huh. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, just one question back to uh, right in the beginning of our interview. We just have time for one more. Um, you talked about this 30% um, were lifestyle factors mm -hmm. um, of health, yeah. 30%, uh, trying to remember now, but that le still leaves 40% um, open, if, I yeah. <laughs> if my maths are right. So totally. what are those factors? Because um, that might be the next step then, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering so, about that. So um, a lot of those we will be addressing as well. They're what we call the social determinants of health. Okay. So things like meaningful employment, uh, adequate income, education, uh, adequate housing, social isolation or social connection, okay. uh, agency and purpose, and then environmental and genetic factors are around 10%. Mm -hmm. So if we live, and that, these obviously aren't the same for everybody, if you live next to a horribly polluting factory, the environmental aspect might be more than 10%. Of course. But generally it's around that. Mm -hmm. um, is that available on your website somewhere as well? Yeah, on, on our homepage there's quite a lot okay. of information about chronic health and the breakup of those, mm. sorry, chronic disease and the breakup of these areas. Also World Health Organization has some great information. Mm -hmm. So um, again, someone at home now, if they wanted to implement just some of these um, tools perhaps that, mm -hmm. um, that can help change those factors, um, where would they best go? What's you mean for themselves on a personal level? For themselves level? in their own community. Because, I mean, we're talking about disadvantaged communities, but also in other communities, yeah. there are people who, you know, might be um, looking for some assistance. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think that if someone is working with other community organisations on a community mm. level, it's really around opening a dialogue around what health and well-being means to that community. So mm. starting with conversation and starting to understand what is it in this community that what is it when, that I do that makes me feel really happy, healthy and well? Mm -hmm. That health is a really broad thing and how do we encourage that? And what are the things that really interfere with my ability to look after myself and my children? Mm. And then to be looking at that. And I think that conversation is just is the most important starting point. Okay. And then perhaps bringing your own passion into it as well, yeah? Mm. That's kind of, if you, yeah. if you know that you have a particular area that you're very skilled in or that yeah. particular interest, then bringing yeah. that into it as well. Yeah. Now, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on or like to talk about because we're about to wrap up? I think that was a lot of yeah? <laughs> great, great discussion. That? Yeah, Thank fantastic. You. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. Pleasure. That was really interesting as well. And I hope we can see you again in a Let's little while. Let's do this while. again yeah. next year and see what the updates I'm are. <laughs> really interested in seeing that. Thank you so Good. much. Thanks, Sal. So.